serpent on these people because he says, blessed be the Lord God of my son Shem and Canaan will be his servant. Then he says, God shall enlarge Japheth, my other son, and he shall dwell in the tents of Shem and Canaan shall be his servant. He just did the same thing that happened in the garden. What God did to the serpent, he now did to a lineage of people. Noah was the earthly father of civilization and sowed discord into the human race. He pitched a group against the other two groups. Actually, he combined the other two into one and he just pretty much made the servant of serpents or the servant like the serpent or of the serpent and then God's servants. Y'all got the picture? Simple to understand. He is speaking of Canaan's seed being the seed of the serpent. He speaks, um, uh, he speaks who the God of Sham and Japheth are, but he never speaks the God of Canaan in that passage. Look at somebody say, wake up. That brings us to Nimrod, of course. Nimrod, son of Cush of the lineage of Canaan, became the world's most demonic ruler and the first ruler of the world. He used his power to indulge in sex orgies and child sacrifices until he was murdered for his offenses against God. He was cut into pieces. Babylon's priest hid the pieces. Y'all know this story. I've given it to you in three different DVDs. Revering them as objects of worship, concealing them in their groves and shrines as the first mysteries. The secret of these relics or mystery was made known to initiates only after a long period of indoctrination when they would be trusted not to betray the worshipers of Baal. This was the true origin of the mysteries from which in Albert Pike's notes in Morals and Dogma, all Masonic rites originate. So they're saying all the Masonic rites originated with these mysteries that were formulated from the pieces of Nimrod. Good stuff right here. The curse of Canaan was extended to the land which was named after him, the land of Canaan. The Canaanites themselves, the people of this land, became the greatest curse upon humanity. And so they remain today. Not only did they originate the practice of demon worship, occultic rites, child sacrifice, and cannibalism, but as they went abroad, they brought these obscene practices into every land which they entered. Not only did they bring their demonic cult to Egypt, but known by the later name, the Phoenicians, as they were called after 1200 BC, they became the demonizers of civilization through successive epochs, being known in medieval times as the Venetians who destroyed the great Byzantine Christian civilization and later as the black nobility which infiltrated the nations of Europe, gradually assumed power through trickery, revolution, and financial deception. So this seed of Ham, the seed of Canaan, this, the Canaanites kept going and going, taking over territory and becoming dominant. Why were they doing all of this? This is going to make a lot of sense to you. Canaan was so wicked that his last will and testament to his children was a formula for vice. This remarkable document of his last will, the will of Canaan, is to be found in, on, in only in the only one place in all the world's theological literature, the Babylonian Talmud, where it is presently written, five things that Canaan charged his sons. This is in the Talmud. Love one another, love robbery, love lewdness, hate your masters, and do not speak the truth. It's an evil lineage. Now, please, get an understanding here. This has nothing to do, look at somebody say, this has nothing to do with skin color. They've tried their best to say that one of them was cursed to be black and one of them, you know, these are the black people he's talking about. Y'all are about to learn a quick lesson about that, that the devil could care less what color you are. We're not talking about the color of, a, of the skin. We're talking about the color of blood. These folk got green blood, serpent, snake blood. Canaan was reacting to the curse. The Canaanites were formed because Canaan was reacting to the curse. He was cursed to be the servant of the servant or serpent. So whenever man is less than others, he will spend his life trying to prove his worth. 
He, I mean, this is a formula for Satan to use as a doorway into the heart of man because a content man doesn't covet. Shem was content. Blessed be the God of Shem. Japheth was content. Blessed be the God of Japheth. They're going to dwell together. But Canaan, you're going you're gonna to be their servant. Without being content, they're going to have to prove, oh yeah? Ham, Cush, and Canaan coveted the God of his brothers. This caused them to create their own gods to overthrow them. Please pay attention. Mythology entered and the legends of false gods began. But this was a pathway to give demons names and legends to explain creation, royal bloodlines, and theology. Mythology is the legends in which demons disguise themselves as gods. So the Canaanites created their own gods, their own stories, their own legends to overthrow the God of gods because of the curse that was placed on Canaan. We're going to be better in this life and we're going to rule. You say that the God of Shem and Japheth, no, our gods are going to rule. This is what they were saying. This is about natural and spiritual lineages. This is blood sacrifice. Human sacrifice involving the eating of the slaughtered human victims derived its name from the combined names of Canaan and the demon god Baal. The two words being combined to form the word cannibal. There we go, the Canaanites. What did the Canaanites do? Human sacrifices. They would burn and eat their victims. Sexual orgies, just doing everything bad. Bisexuality was the worship of Baal and Baphomet. We talked about that in part seven. War against the truth, because the truth makes them low. Become great, they're gonna redeem the curse of Canaan. Sorcery, magic, secret oaths, and rituals were all a part of the Canaanites' dominant culture. Take the world from the God of their brothers. This is, this is what they want to do. So they want to take the world. So the devil now has a lineage that he can operate through. And we, we're not going to be low like God said, but we're going to take the world from God's people. And they want to make their God, Satan, great in the earth. Everybody caught up? Y'all understand what's going on here? Makes a lot of sense. God even warned his people in Deuteronomy about these Canaanites. And here's what he said. And when the Lord thy God shall deliver them bef before thee, thou shalt smite them and utterly destroy them. Look at somebody and say, God wasn't playing. Get rid of them Canaanites. Destroy all of them. They're evil. Thou shalt make no covenant with them, nor show mercy unto them, neither shall thou make marriages with them. Thy daughter shall, uh, thou shalt not give unto his son, nor his, son, uh, his daughter shall thou take unto thy son. For they will turn away thy son from following me, that they may serve what? Other gods. So will the anger of the Lord be kindled against you and destroy thee suddenly. But thus shall ye deal, this is how you deal with them. Ye shall destroy their altars, break down their images, and cut down their groves, and burn their graven images with fire. This is God telling you how to deal with this demon seed of people, this, serp, this serpent seed, this reptilian seed of the serpent that has found a lineage to operate through because they want to be better in the earth because they were cursed to be servants or low. God said, whenever somebody is cursed like that, there's only one way to deal with them. Destroy them. Because they're going to keep trying to rise to the top like a Cheerio. Remember that song, Cheerio? Then God always said, but, but if you do not obey me, here's what's going to happen. Here's what the Canaanites are going to do to you if you just start liking them and letting them live and start liking their stuff and start, you know, mixing with them and giving them your sons and daughters to marry and you intermingle with them, here's what's going to happen. 
28 and 43, the stranger that is within thee shall get up above thee very high, and thou shalt come down very low. And he shall lend to thee, and thou shalt not lend to him. He's going to have all the money. He shall be the head, and you're going to be the tail. Moreover, all these curses shall come upon thee and shall pursue thee and overtake thee till thou be destroyed because thou hearkenest not unto the voice of the Lord thy God to keep his commandments and his statutes which he commanded thee. And they shall be upon thee for a sign and for a wonder and upon thy what? They are coming after your children forever. That's Bible. That's a Nephilim giant, Nimrod uh, statue, supposedly. Since the original Nephilim had all perished in the great flood, God began a new breeding program situated specifically to prevent the Israelites from occupying the promised land. The serpent seed continued to produce giants to make gods of men. Canaan's descendants were corrupted by the seed of the devil. And here are some... Um, Examples of this, I wanted to put these in this presentation because I didn't have room in the other. This is very important. In Genesis 14, it tells us, the, now these, this is after the flood. Nephilim occurrences after the flood. A coalition of five kings from around the southeastern shores of the Dead Sea fought and defeated three groups of warriors known as the Raphites, the Zuzites, and the Emites. The Raphites were descendants of Rapha, which means giant in Hebrew. The name Zuzite means roving creature and Emite means terrible one. So these are three groups of giants descending, of course, from the, uh, the Canaanites. Then in Deuteronomy 1 and 26, we find references to the Anakites, long-necked giants, and the Emites again, both identified as descendants of Raphi, the giant. Deuteronomy 3 and 11, references made to Og, the king of Bashan, a descendant of Rapha, whose bed was 13 feet long and eight feet wide. In Numbers 13 and 33, the account of 12 spies included sightings of Nephilim, saying that the descendants of Anak come from the Nephilim. Fear of the Nephilim is what made 10 of those 12 spies give a bad report, persuading the Israelites not to go into the promised land. All this took place in the time of Moses. Joshua 14 and 15, at the end of the conquest of the land, Caleb is given Hebron, formerly known as Kariath Arba, because it was founded by Arba called the greatest of the Anakites. So this is the land where the great giants dwell. And then of course you know the story of David and Goliath and Goliath was a giant. All of these were descendants of Canaan and a result of the curse or the serpent seed being among men by what Cain did in the field with Abel. Brings us to, you've heard this phrase before, blue blood. Now we call blue blood royal blood. That's the royal. Blue is the color for royalty. That's royal blood as in royal blue. And this is the blood of those that run our world, so to speak. But the origin of the word blue, blue blood is an English expression recorded since 1834 for noble birth or descent. It is a translation of the Spanish phrase sangre azul, which describes the Spanish royal family and other high nobility who claim to be pure, free of Moorish or Jewish blood, being of this Gothic descent. There's no connection between this and the actual color of blood, uh, the color of nobility. So this is what we call blue blood. Blue blood is the blood of the elite or those that are special in our world. Inbreeding started by asterisks. What is inbreeding? Inbreeding is when you have sex with your own family to keep it in the family. So when you got this blue blood, you can't let the blue blood out. So you got to keep multiplying within your family to keep the blood royal and to keep it pure. All right? But this started with Nimrod and Nimrod's wife, Samarimus, or Ashtoreth. She's wife of Nimrod who claimed to give birth and have sex with the same person. She gave birth to the person that she supposedly had sex with and he was reincarnated. This is where it starts. Nimrod, uh, this created the idea to keep the Canaanite royal blood in the family for the seed of the serpent to continue. So they're going to keep the blood pure so that this blood, this bloodline from Nimrod, now this, this cursed DNA from, you know, uh, uh, the curse of Canaan, now we're talking about blood that is carried as or considered royal blood, it's serpent blood. 
The Canaanites migrated from the royal bloodline of the Egyptian pharaohs to Babylon, then to Rome, and now to Great Britain. The royal bloodline or reptilian seed is now ruling the world from the European Union's control of America. Now let me tell you something in here. Please pay attention, okay? Because there are gonna be some shocking things you're gonna hear that might be hard to digest, but I want you to trust me, amen because I'm gonna give you what God pressed on my heart to give you. The royal bloodline of reptilian seed is now ruling the world from the EU. America is under the influence of Satan through the royal bloodline of presidents and Freemasons that have taken oaths to receive the bloodline of the serpent. The kings and queens of old claim their right to be leaders and royalty because of their inbred bloodlines. They had a mixture of human and alien DNA, which they feel gives them a connection to the gods. For those that are not born into this DNA, they can receive, please, remember this word, they can receive a spiritual transfusion as Cain did by shedding innocent blood or giving an offering of a blood sacrifice. Rituals give rites of passage into the evil Canaanite bloodline. Did y'all just grab that spiritual blood transfusion? So you can change the blood that's in you spiritually. Some people are saying, no, you can't. Well, then you can't accept Christ as your personal savior. When we accept Christ as our personal savior, we receive his blood. If any man be in Christ, he's a what? New creation. Behold, all things become new. We are part of his bloodline. We are grafted. The Bible uses a, 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 a doctor's term. Gra we are grafted in. So our blood becomes his blood. And we do it through a ritual. Look at somebody scared of the word. No, the, 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 I know it sounds like a haunted word, but it's not really a bad word. <laughs> Talk about that in a minute. Secret societies, Greek letter frats and sororities, Freemasons, etc., are, are movements that are submitted to the gods of the movement. Greek societies, Greek letter frats, sorors, Freemasons, etc., are movements that are submitted to the gods of the movement. Come on. I mean, ain't that true? Don't you pledge to a god? A Greek god? When you go through initiation and hazing, you are performing a ritual or rite of passage into the evil bloodline of Satan worship. Somebody says, well, how is it Satan worship? You don't remember what I told you? Mythology are the legends in which demons disguise themselves. They let you know they was a bunch of demons, you ain't pledging. But if they look like an old Greek god that had the power to make the sun rise and fall or cover the world with his body, then it looks, you know, oh yeah, that's just a legend. Where do you think the legend came from? These guys were describing what demons were to them. Demons gave them information. Demons gave them knowledge. Demons gave them technology. Though you may try to retain the true God of gods while you pledging. I said, though you may try to retain the true God while you pledging, you deny him when you accept the false God of the organization. That's new members class 101, first day of Sunday school. Thou shall have no of the God before. Can we learn the Ten Commandments? The reason God was mad the whole Old Testament was because there was other gods before him. Can I preach in here? And folks will still hear that and say, yeah, but, but, yo, but, if you pledge to a false god. Though you may try to retain the God, you deny him. 
once you accept the God of the organization. And you stand in support, uh-oh, and allegiance with the organization as they propagate the agenda of the enemy. How do they propagate the agenda? Well, remember the party they had? Folks was buck naked, drunk, and dancing, and nasty. You don't remember that? Well, I didn't participate. Oh, but you were a part of the organization. Them your brothers and sisters? The very reason a person is attracted to a secret society is the same reason Eve ate, Cain killed, and Nimrod was against God. To be like a God in this life, and to be great or better in the eyes of men. Can I keep preaching in here? It's truth, man. I like this truth. I want God, I, I, you know, I told God, I said, you know, you speak this to me in a way where, you know, the folks just have to just, when it's over, they just have to say, well, I just choose the devil. Now you don't need to argue with this because it's all fact, it's all, so I just, I just want to serpent blood. Just, where are the snakes? I'm going with the snakes. <laughs> when you receive these rites of passage, you no longer serve God, but you serve the God of your organization. You become an instrument of the false gods and you are used by them instead of the true God. You bring curses upon yourself, your family. You give the enemy access to your life's plan as he guides you into self-fulfillment and self-gratification. Knowledge of self is the enemy of God. The enlightened ones being used by Satan. This is the serpent seed, the bloodline of Cain, the Canaanites' curse, and the ruling power of earth.